We'll be talking about fetal arrhythmias and management. Um, everything you need to know about this uh, that'll be covered on the board exam. So my objectives uh, are as follows. We're gonna talk a little bit about assessing fetal heart rate and rhythm. A bit more about the fetus in distress. We talked a lot about that in the first talk. Uh, we're gonna talk about ectopy and then true bona fide tachycardias and bradycardias, how to recognize them, how to manage them. And then we'll talk about maternal disease and AV block, including more about complete congenital heart block that we touched on earlier. Uh, so this, uh, just to note, the fetal heartbeat actually, as you know, starts really quite early, um, usually by about f uh, five, six weeks, you can detect it. Um, and by the time that we're seeing patients around 18 weeks, uh, the adrenergic receptor, sympathetic parasympathetic innervation, all of that has happened already. So a normal fetal heart rate in the second and third trimester when we're seeing patients is considered 110 to 180. Uh, so below 110 would be bradycardia, above 180 would be considered tachycardia. And I'm gonna structure the talk really to talk about three main categories. We're gonna talk about uh, irregular rhythm in the middle. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about tachycardias. That's a lot of where your questions will be focused. Uh, and then the important aspects of bradycardias that'll, that are important to know about as well. So let's just talk about how common is it to have an arrhythmia? Well, it's relatively uncommon. One to 3% of fetuses will have it. And only about 10% of those turn out to be important uh, in terms of causing morbidity. Uh, and this is a slide, we actually saw this in the first talk. Just to note, when you have bradycardia, and that's defined again, under 110 per minute that's sustained, uh, and you have congenital heart disease, uh, there, there's a, sorry, there's a 50% risk of congenital heart disease when you have abnormal AV conduction. That would imply, for example, L-loop ventricles and so forth. Um, important to know that long QT syndrome can present as sinus bradycardia, so it's certainly on your differential for a sustained fetal bradycardia, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, tachycardia over 180 per minute, we mentioned in the earlier talk, they have a baseline risk of congenital heart disease with an irregular rhythm, pretty much the same is true. Uh, however, we do see those patients because it may be an indication of that there's a more complex rhythm disorder as well. How do we assess the rhythm? Well, it's a little bit hard to do. Uh, you're all familiar with the obstetrical fetal heart rate monitors. You sort of strap on the abdomen. Turns out those are really good if you're in physiologic heart rates. But once you get over, say, 220, 240, uh, you really lose your ability to discern what's going on with the rhythm. You just can tell that it's fast. So it's not very helpful for deciding what kind of rhythm disorder it is. You can do fetal ECG. It's technically hard to do, and it turns out that the vernix caseosa is actually a great insulator. So it really affects your ability to detect the fetal uh, electrical heart signals. There is a fetal magnetocardiography available. There are a few labs in the US. It's really considered at this point still a research tool. It's not something that's clinically readily available. Uh, and you're all familiar with, of course, as you get in the delivery suite, the fetal scalp lead. Those are actually quite useful for fetal arrhythmias, but by then, clearly you're already uh, close to delivery. 